So last weekend, CNN's Dana Bash released an hour-long special report on the rise of anti-Semitism in America. She spoke with some experts and victims to provide a window into what is a growing problem in the US. Just in 2021, there were over 2,700 anti-Semitic incidents, a 34% rise in 2020. And while Jews are under 2% of the population, they're targeted by 60% of all religious hate crimes. So while this documentary is right in that anti-Semitism is a real problem and a growing problem, CNN proved yet again that the left doesn't actually care about anti-Semitism. Sure, they might care about some of it, like when it happens on the right, but they simply don't want to admit that it's just a bigger problem on the left, especially in leftist havens like New York City, where life has become almost inhospitable for Jews. Unless you were in an airport and happened to watch the report, I don't expect you to have seen it, so I'll walk you through it. It began as most documentaries on anti-Semitism do. Imagery of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, snapshots of various anti-Semitic attacks in recent years like the ones in Chicago, New Jersey and Kansas City, more imagery of white supremacists and neo-Nazis chanting Jews will not replace us in Charlottesville, which is all important to include because yes, these are examples of demonstrably disgusting anti-Semitism. But then CNN moved on to examples in politics. Now, even the CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, Jonathan Greenblatt, who's interviewed throughout this report and is a Democrat, said that anti-Semitism has become a prop for people on both the right and the left. So who did CNN use to represent anti-Semitism in politics? Donald Trump, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and Robert Kennedy Jr. Seems like there's a few names missing there. Just minutes into the documentary, they laid the groundwork. Anti-Semitism in politics is a massive problem on the right, demonstrated by an entire segment dedicated to the big bad orange man, very bad, very orange, Donald Trump. It all began by discussing the anti-Semitic response to Julia Ioffe, a Jewish journalist who wrote a profile for GQ on Melania Trump during the 2016 campaign. When it was criticized as a hit piece, Julia Ioffe argued that nothing is off limits when it comes to the family members of presidential candidates. <laughs> How things change. And Ioffe was used as an example of the revolting anti-Semitism launched by troll armies against Jewish journalists on a pretty routine basis. And while the hate she received is obviously abhorrent, why was Ioffe featured as the only Jewish journalist targeted by this abuse? Ben Shapiro was targeted more than any other Jewish journalist in 2016, and it's not even close. Ioffe didn't even make the top 10. Why weren't others mentioned? Well, because this segment had two goals. The first was to objectively show the online harassment against Jewish journalists, which is a real problem that I myself have faced. The second was to subjectively connect the dots between anti-Semitism and Trump. Time for some mental gymnastics, because if you look at Trump as a person, or look at Trump's actions in office, there's no way you can argue he's anti-Semitic. His daughter and son-in-law are Jewish, he's got Jewish grandchildren, and he's the most pro-Israel president in American history. So if you can't prove that Donald Trump hates Jews, then you have to do the next best thing. Prove that Donald Trump endorses hate against Jews. Things do get a bit murky here, because Donald Trump's comments in 2016 were troubling if you objectively care about anti-Semitism. At times, he didn't reject extreme elements of the Republican right, which embrace anti-Semitism, and he didn't speak clearly on many related issues. But just because someone's rejection of anti-Semitism is insufficient or clumsy or even ignorant at times, that doesn't mean you yourself are an anti-Semite, or that you even support anti-Semitism. That's certainly not the metric used for Democrats, after all. But if you're a conservative, the left has a bizarre demand that you must endlessly denounce anyone or anything they present to you even if you've already done so or if you know nothing about it. If you fail or even partly fail, even just once, regardless of why, that's all the evidence they need to present you as a supporter of hate. And when this fails, they can always rely on pushing the lie that you never rejected these groups in the first place. When asked to call out white supremacists, and right proud proud boys, boys, stand back and stand by. And when, when he stood there days after Charlottesville and said, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. The neo-Nazis knew exactly what he meant. Even though, for the millionth time, he specifically called out neo-Nazis and white supremacists in that very same speech. And I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But to Jonathan Greenblatt, even that doesn't matter. If Donald Trump convincingly, consistently, clearly called out the extremists and the anti-Semites, it wouldn't even matter what he said in that moment. So before we move on to anti-Semitism on the left, let's recap how anti-Semitism on the right was presented. Neo-Nazis, white supremacists, Hitler, the Holocaust, and the argument that through insufficient rejection of these groups and events, Donald Trump is responsible for the rise of anti-Semitism in the United States. Words matter. That's drilled into us time after time during this documentary. Regardless of his actions, 
Trump is responsible for anti-Semitism because of his words. Finally, after discussing other areas of anti-Semitism, including radicalization online and those who blame Jews for COVID-19, 40 minutes into this 60-minute report, CNN decided it's time to look at anti-Semitism on the left. And what was one example used? The example of a Jewish college student who was effectively driven off campus by threats and abuse after she shared a pro-Israel post on social media. And while this is another important example of what's known as contemporary anti-Semitism, the repackaging of traditional anti-Semitism under the umbrella of being anti-Israel or anti-Zionist, CNN completely shifted the tone of this documentary the moment they started talking about their own side. When it was about so-called right-wing anti-Semitism, they had no problem calling out those to blame, even naming specific people and groups. But when they got to left-wing anti-Semitism, the clarity they claimed to crave vanished. And not only did it vanish, it was replaced by progressive Jews defending anti-Semites on the left. Yes, the left is anti-Semitic, but it's only because they love Palestinians so much that they're blind to pesky consequences like hating Jews. The language of the left fighting for the political, racial, and social justice, unfortunately, sometimes I'll say inadvertently, is creating an atmosphere that is, instead of promoting true inclusivity and acceptance of diversity, it's promoting a perspective that is creating uh, an environment that is hostile towards Jews. Don't worry, it's just inadvertent anti-Semitism. Why is CNN suddenly making excuses for anti-Semitism? Was the same inadvertent excuse used when Donald Trump didn't reject white supremacists sufficiently clearly enough? Not only that, Dana Bash, the supposedly objective reporter in all this, added the media's favorite expert say comment to make sure you don't get the wrong idea. Experts across the board caution anti-Semitism is growing on the left, but it is not equivalent to hate from the right. And one of the interviewees added to what was basically a propaganda effort. I'm certainly more, more terrified of the right, of people who are white nationalists, who are armed, who have a history of walking into synagogues and opening fire. And on the left, it is more in the discourse. I want to break this down because it's truly insane. First off, it's just not true. Just because someone feels a certain way, feeling less threatened by their own political side than the opposing political side, doesn't make it rational or even correct given that violent anti-Semitic attacks are carried out by people across the political spectrum. You're certainly allowed to feel more afraid of one group over another, but if you're the victim of an anti-Semitic attack, which are often violent in nature, does it matter who's doing it? And also, why is this a binary choice? Getting kicked in the balls might be worse than getting kicked in the stomach, but I don't want to be kicked at all. I thought this documentary was about fighting the rise of anti-Semitism in America. Why are we suddenly categorizing it as better or worse based on who commits it? Not only that, explain this to me. The premise of this entire documentary is that words matter. We are told that the Holocaust started with words. So why does intent suddenly matter for those on the left, but doesn't matter for, say, Donald Trump on the right? Another question. Why were most of the experts Dana Bash interviewed on right-wing anti-Semitism on the left, when most of the same experts were then used to explain left-wing anti-Semitism? And not only that, given that we zoomed in on specific figures on the right, like Donald Trump, who I don't think is anti-Semitic, and people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is either anti-Semitic or colossally stupid, or both, isn't it strange that they were so vague about the people carrying out anti-Semitism on the left? No names, no faces, no groups. When they were discussing left-wing anti-Semitism, one of the experts defined it like this. When it crosses a line into anti-Semitism is when you either use classic anti-Semitic tropes, so things like Jews having too much power, Zionists controlling the world, um, Jews, Jews wanting money, or when you hear things like, well, today's Jews aren't the real Jews, um, they were just descended from European converts, so that's, that's anti-Semitism. So let's look at some prominent figures on the left who fall under this description who were completely ignored by CNN. First, this definition of anti-Semitism describes Congresswoman Ilan Omar. She's accused Jews of hypnotizing the world from Israel's evil doings. She said that American support for Israel is motivated by Jewish money. And she's described Jewish self-defense against indiscriminate rocket fire as terrorism. But I'm sure the rockets raining down on Jewish civilians in Israel don't hurt because it's just discourse. And what about Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib? She's hinted that a Jewish cabal is controlling the world behind the curtain while trying to profit on suffering. She's pushed blood libels that read like they're straight out of 1930s Germany. And she's accused American Jews of being more loyal to Israel. But even when a Palestinian American congresswoman is anti-Semitic, Trump is still to blame. And somehow, CNN spent one hour talking about anti-Semitism in the US 
without mentioning the Boycott, Divestment and Sanction or BDS movement, which is an openly anti-Semitic group which singles out and targets Jewish businesses and individuals, a movement that Ilan Omar, Rashid Tlaib and others vocally support. If we are supposed to believe that silence or lack of sufficient condemnation is seen as endorsement, why are Ilan Omar and Rashid Tlaib elevated rather than rejected? Nancy Pelosi, she's Speaker of the House, so kind of important. Well, here she is with Ilan Omar. And again, and again, here they are together on the cover of Rolling Stone. Donald Trump didn't sufficiently reject David Duke, who's politically irrelevant. Nancy Pelosi is hugging Ilan Omar, who is still on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Doesn't this matter? And if anti-Zionist anti-Semitism is bad, which CNN seems to agree, why wasn't Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez included? She's the most famous Democrat in the country, and she's practically pen pals with Jeremy Corbyn, who's best buds with Hamas and Hezbollah, who want to kill all the Jews, and she said that Israel is occupying Palestinian territory before admitting she knew nothing about it. What people are starting to see, at least in, in the occupation uh, of, of Palestine, is um, just an, an increasing crisis of humanitarian condition. You use the term the occupation of Palestine. Mm. What did oh. you mean by that? Oh, um... On this subject, why didn't CNN even mention Islamic antisemitism? This form of antisemitism obviously goes far beyond discourse. Just look at Islamic extremism in the Middle East, in Europe, and in the US. I'm scared of that too. And the person who carried out the attack on the synagogue in Texas was a British Pakistani. Not many of them in neo-Nazi circles. And then there's antisemitism in black communities across the country, but particularly in cities like New York, which Democrats just refuse to acknowledge. Now, it is important to understand that it is true that there is a shared history of activism in favor of civil rights between Jews and African Americans, and I'm not trying to ignore or downplay these efforts at all, but it's crucial to acknowledge that antisemitism is a problem in many black communities, and it's a problem that needs to be addressed. Three violent attacks were carried out against Jews in New York just this month, August 2nd, a black man punched an Orthodox Jewish man in the face in Queens. Is he a MAGA supporter? August 9th, a black woman choked a Jewish woman on a subway platform in Manhattan. Is she a fan of David Duke? August 20th, a group of black teenagers sprayed an Orthodox Jewish man with a fire extinguisher and then hit him in the face. Are they neo-Nazis on the prowl? Again, this is just from this month and just in New York. In 2022, the vast, vast majority of violent assaults on Jews in New York weren't committed by white supremacists marching around with tiki torches, but young black men. Are physical assaults still discourse? Should Jews be less scared of these random assaults happening every week because the perpetrators probably voted for Biden instead of Trump? Now, during this documentary, CNN focused more on non-random planned attacks, so let's take a look at those. Since 2016, according to the ADL, there have been at least six deadly attacks on Jews by individuals with connections to extremist or anti-Semitic groups or ideologies. Two of these, the kosher market shooting in New Jersey and the attack on a Hanukkah party in New York, both in December 2019, were committed by people with links to radical black Hebrew Israelites, a group which claims to be the true descendants of ancient Jews. That fits the definition of left-wing antisemitism, and yet they're not mentioned either. And how did CNN talk about antisemitism in the US for an hour and not mention Louis Farrakhan? He said that Jews have no connection to Israel, that Jewish power controls Hollywood through anal sex, that satanic Jews have infected the whole world with poison and deceit, that when you want something in this world, the Jew holds the door, the Jews are his enemy, and that they're like insects. These are all ideas that drive the violent attacks we're seeing on the streets of cities like New York. And what about Al Sharpton? By the left's own standards, he's incited deadly attacks against Jews on at least two occasions. The Freddy's Fashion Mart protests and the Crown Heights riots in 1991, when mobs chanted death to Jews in the streets, with Sharpton saying, among other things, if the Jews want to get it on, tell them to pin their yarmulkes back and come over to my house. But don't worry, it's just discourse. What about Jesse Jackson, who referred to Jews as Jaimes and New York City as Town in 1984? What about Ice Cube, Nick Cannon, P. Diddy, Stephen Jackson, Deshaun Jackson and Alice Walker? They've all pushed anti-Semitic tropes. Do you think black teenagers in New York City are listening to Louis Farrakhan or Donald Trump, Al Sharpton or David Duke, Ice Cube or Marjorie Taylor Greene? And if CNN truly believes that discourse leads to violence and that Jews being blamed for the spread of COVID is an example of antisemitism, why didn't they mention New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio or then New York Governor Andrew Cuomo for singling out Jewish communities and their policies and their rhetoric? Isn't all antisemitism worthy of condemnation? Well, the fact is, in the eyes of the left, it's not. Because they want you to watch this documentary and come away with the following conclusion. That antisemitism is a violent problem on the extreme right with some comparatively minor bubbling issues on the left when it comes to Israel, which are 
excused or explained away by legitimate concerns about Palestinian human rights. But that's a lie. Anti-Semitism is a violent problem on the extreme right and the extreme left, enabled by passive anti-Semitism on the right, left and the middle. The fight against anti-Semitism is really important to me. It's something I face for most of my life and as a conservative Jew in the US, it's crucial that I call out anti-Semitism when I see it on both sides because I actually want to fight anti-Semitism. That's why I don't make excuses for anyone who pushes anti-Semitic tropes, regardless of whether they're on my side or not. Because fighting anti-Semitism matters more to me than elevating a Republican or denigrating a Democrat based on some other political narrative. Because anti-Semitism is an equal opportunities form of bigotry. If you're a Jewish person being abused online or attacked in the streets of New York or murdered in your business or synagogue, does it matter who your attacker voted for? Until we can speak honestly about all anti-Semitism in America, how can we expect it to change? And how can we expect it to change until people care more about protecting Jews than protecting votes? Thanks for watching. If you like that clip, subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch full episodes and other clips just like this one. Make sure you ring the bell for notifications and tell all your friends about it.